I'd like to uh, jump on top of the welcome that Chris gave everyone this morning and say it is a pleasure to see everyone. It's a pleasure to look forward to spending uh, these days together uh, working uh, with each other and, and for this great organization. I want to thank Frank Weisbarth for this uh, beautiful cutthroat trout picture that he sent me. Uh, before I begin, uh, I want to give an update uh, on Larry Harris. He is the National Leadership Council chairman, and as most of you know, uh, he had to have quadruple bypass surgery uh, a couple of weeks ago while he was on a western fishing trip. Had his surgery in Billings. He is back home now, uh, recovering uh, very well. And he has asked me to uh, read the following message. Hello and best wishes to my TU family. And thanks to all of you who sent me supportive emails, calls, flowers, and cards. I know the power of your wishes and prayers helped me through the recovery. I want you all to know that I wish dearly to be there with you, but I know that uh, Tom Anneker will more than fill in for me. I also want to acknowledge Duke Welter, who recognized my condition and got me off the mountain to medical help. I am on my way to a complete recovery and look forward to working with all of you in the coming year, Larry. And I know we all extend our wishes and can't wait to see him again. So let's. Before I jump into the mundane details that will come, I wanted to add just a, a couple of anecdotes about Larry's situation. Uh, he had his surgery starting just before midnight on a Friday night, and it continued until 5 o'clock in the morning uh, on Saturday. And uh, I received a call from him uh, 26 hours late, later on Sunday morning. Uh, and so he was wanting to make sure that uh, everybody knew that he was all right and, and he was worried about uh, the volunteer TU work that he loved so much. And uh, I was able to go visit him that day. I walked into his room and, and there he is sitting on the edge of his bed you know, very alert, big smile on his face. Had his wife there and, and two boys. And, and uh, he's telling Lena and Oli jokes that he heard from John Christensen. <laughs> so, you know, his choice of humor as his sense of humor was recovering had to be those jokes. So that's, that's Larry. Uh, the other thing I want you to know, and gives me great confidence in his recovery, is uh, his doctors prevented him from, from traveling to this meeting, and he's negotiating uh, with them all this week. You know, can I just go for one day? So I expect that uh, uh, he is going to come roaring back and will, will be amongst us very shortly. And uh, I look closely at this photo. This was taken on the trip that he and Duke were having out west. And this is one of the places they stopped for lunch and these turkeys came up and, and joined them. And, you know, to, I don't know about you, to, but to me this seems uh, uh, very good fodder for a caption contest. <laughs> I also want to I also want to say we all owe Duke Welter a debt of gratitude. Even though he is now a recovering attorney, he still has the ability of critical thought and decisive action. He recognized what was happening with Larry. He uh, convinced him to abandon a, a great fishing trip and drive into town and seek medical help. And they were in Wyoming, and they took off for Sheridan to seek medical uh, advisement. Uh, lots of deer on the road, and, and Larry's comment to me was, if I wasn't having a heart attack, I would have had one because of the trip down the road. <laughs> so this is Duke uh, later on uh, after Larry 
went to the hospital on the Clark Fork uh, performing a little levitation act. Uh, Duke, Duke is uh, back in Wisconsin uh, trying to perform similar magic in the Driftless area. But please, when you see Duke, uh, please thank him and, and uh, let him know that uh, he played a vital role in saving Larry's life. This presentation is on the state of the grassroots. And I guess basically jumping into this, who are the grassroots? The, definary, def, excuse me, the dictionary definition uh, states that uh, the grassroots are the basic or fundamental source of support uh, as in a movement. And I think that's very reflective of, of, of what um, uh, our grassroots is. The 150,000 members, the 377 chapters, the 36 councils, the 36 council chairs, uh, the NLC representatives, and the grassroots trustees. And I've listed this as the uh, traditional uh, view of what the grassroots is. And I think this was a, a good definition, but I think under uh, the new strategic plan and under the one TU view, a more accurate description of who the grassroots is, is that it is all of us. And you see it every day. You see uh, staff working with volunteers, working with volunteer leadership, uh, working with national leadership, working with trustees, you know, over and over again, every day, you see these examples of all of us working together. And that is how we are at our best, when we are all uh, focused on uh, the same goal and all applying what our, uh, our gifts are, what our, what our energies are, what our passions are, and what our experience is. So the state of the grassroots. Uh, this year there were two new chapters that joined us, the Foothills chapter here in North Carolina and the Bosque chapter in uh, New Mexico. And I want to just uh, take a moment to talk about that chapter. There had been uh, a chapter in Albuquerque uh, that went defunct. And there were a lot of people interested in Trout Unlimited, but they lacked the uh, the, the focus and the leadership to, to continue to function as a chapter. Well, this year uh, they came back online. Uh, one of the major reasons was a retired conservation biologist who is providing leadership for that chapter now. And also there was an issue, the, the fires that Chris talked about in New Mexico that were uh, uh, challenging and, and uh, uh, making it difficult for the recovery efforts for the Gila trout and the real grand cutthroat trout and these issues have, have become a rallying point and here's a new chapter starting uh, with 400 members so uh, like the streams that we can restore we can also get back and restore some of our important chapters it's been a very busy year for the chapters in the councils we all are experiencing the the tougher than usual economic times, uh, uh, fundraising efforts have, have been difficult and have had to be redoubled, but you have seen from the financials that, that, that the organization is, is healthy. Uh, we are uh, a year and a half into uh, a total bylaw revision process for the entire organi organization, which started uh, with the national bylaws and is now uh, at the level of the council and chapter bylaws. Uh, we, we did reach uh, a milestone recently. We have 206 uh, bylaw revisions completed that we know about. We know about them when they are posted to the national website. And so that leaves uh, about half uh, that need to be done. And so I'm making a call uh, that everyone join in and, and help any chapter or any council that hasn't uh, made or completed their revisions, encourage them to get it done. Our, 
ultimate goal is to have this done uh, by the end of December this year. Same thing with the strategic plans. Uh, those are being uh, uh, developed and, and, and being uh, filed and uploaded to the national website. Uh, and it's an ongoing process, but we're looking to see a completion of that as well. Both the new bylaws, the revised bylaws, and the strategic plans are being posted to the national website. So there's going to be an electronic repository for the first time. And so we won't have situations where there are uh, long-term searches for bylaws or strategic plans. And we don't have to rely on somebody back at national going to the file cabinet and maybe finding something that we're looking for. It'll be readily available. Um, a new uh, real property policy was adopted by the Board of Trustees this year, and uh, there was uh, review, uh, input, and discussion by the grassroots, and prior to that, and, and, and continuing, is the effort to identify all pieces of property and property interests uh, held by the organization. We are, we are currently, uh, and at this meeting, we'll be looking at adopting a policy under this uh, real property interest area for uh, agreements that uh, relate to access for, for recreational fishing. You've heard a little bit about the policy on stocking over native fish that was adopted this year. This was an issue that arose between two states. There was a difference of opinion and philosophy but it caused us to look inwardly at what our core values were as an organization with respect to the relationship between uh, native fish and non-native fish and, and stocking of non-native fish and where that might be appropriate. And uh, there was a, a committee formed in the NLC uh, made up of a diverse uh, area of interest from, from, uh, uh, from around the country and a policy was developed uh, which has been uh, adopted and will, I believe, serve the organization uh, very well going forward. Uh, in 2011, we adopted a policy on subchapters, and uh, this process is going forward with the first subchapter in Colorado uh, being developed. This is just a new way to form a chapter. It's, it's an outgrowth or a bud. Uh, often existing chapter that helps uh, a group within that chapter uh, get on their feet, get established, and, and able to fly on their own at some point to create a new chapter. You've seen some of these numbers or seen some of the graphs on this, but I just wanted to uh, touch on this again. Uh, 366 of the 377 chapters and all 36 counseled filed their uh, financial reports on time this year. Uh, in that group, there were nine chapters that reported both zero dollars in revenue and zero hours of volunteer work. And uh, there are a number of chapters that are in the, in the process of, of uh, being reviewed, uh, in the process of being assisted to get back on their feet. And I think with that, those last numbers, those zero numbers reflect our uh, early in the process for those chapters, that they're just just now getting started. Uh, they're not uh, uh, they're not functioning yet, but there is an expectation that they will be in the very near future. This is also the uh, first year of the second round of uh, rechartering chapters, and the the first batch is moving up through the system and will be looked at by the board of trustees meeting on Sunday. As far as the uh, uh, revenues, uh, the $8,949,289 in revenue were generated by uh, the grassroots last year. A total of 651, 212 hours of volunteer time uh, was reported. Uh, if you equate that uh, volunteer time to Two dollars. That's uh, thirteen million dollars, and uh, nine hundred nine thousand eight hundred eighty-eight for a for a total of twenty-two point nine uh, million dollars, which is which is impressive, which is a, a significant portion uh, of the total revenue of the organization. 
I think you've seen a breakdown of, of where the volunteer hours was, and there's a mistake on this slide that I'll, I'll point out. I apologize for it, but uh, fundraising was about 12% of the volunteer hours. Um, general operation, 24%. Youth conservation should just be conservation hours, and those are conservation, restoration projects, 28%. Um, the education hours uh, should be youth education at 15%, and then other education was the 12% with 9% for travel. So that is how our chapter members are basically spending their time, the areas that they are involved in, and, and how that breakdown goes. Uh, the grassroots uh, leveraged or matched uh, funds in the amount of $1,500,000. Next, I want to uh, talk uh, about the uh, National Leadership Council. As you should be aware, the function of the NLC is to establish the National Conservation Agenda. And tomorrow, uh, during the NLC business meeting, we will be uh, visiting that topic and voting on the conservation agenda for the organization for the upcoming year. Uh, the other role uh, that the NLC plays is to facilitate the develop development of organizational uh, capacity. This past year, we had two goals uh, that we were focusing on in the NLC in addition to our regular workload. And the first was to energize and, and increase the effectiveness and efficiency of our work groups. And a second goal was to assist uh, in the improvement of the regional meetings that are occurring. Something new last year with respect to the conservation agenda was that we added a breakout for critical focus areas. And the ones that we identified uh, are listed here. And as you uh, listened to Chris's uh, talk previously, you saw that uh, you know, a lot of the TU work is, is in fact hitting uh, very squarely uh, all of these uh, uh, different topics. What we wanted to do was to call these different topics out to uh, give attention to them. These are our highest priorities, at least looking forward for the, for the next 12 months uh, as, we, as we judge it. Uh, the conservation agenda is quite broad terms. It's an overall policy, but this helps people understand what we're interested in, what we're working on. And this is part of what is uh, uh, up on the public portion of our, our current website. wanted to talk briefly uh, about uh, some of the work on, on, on one of the uh, uh, critical focus areas. I picked the Yellowstone Native Fish Project, which Chris also uh, had some, some great uh, information on. I have a, a few more things that I wanted to add to what he presented. Um, the three surrounding states, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, along with the National Parks Conservation Association, uh, the Yellowstone Park Foundation, and the Greater Yellowstone uh, Coalition uh, entered into a formal MOU with Yellowstone Park this year. It took about a year, a little bit more, to get that drafted and everybody to agree to it. But what it does is it sets out uh, how the, the groups make decisions, how we communicate with each other, and what our shared vision is. So this is a very important document moving forward. Uh, where we're starting with the native fish conservation in Yellowstone is with suppression of the lake trout. And you heard about the uh, telemetry studies that are ongoing. Uh, this year, uh, the collective group raised $113,000 uh, to provide the funds for the uh, implanting of the transmitters in the fish. So far this year, more than 260,000 uh, lake trout have been netted, and this is a number from a, a week or 10 days ago, and, and they will be continuing their, their, their netting until ice conditions, which is probably about the second week in October. 
but this is a record uh, number of lake trout that they've uh, been able to net this year, um, and, and things are, are looking very positive. The last two years when they do their fish census work, they are finding small but significant increases in the population, and that's the first time we've had an upward trend in, in many years. One of the other uh, uh, processes or procedures that they're using is to uh, place trap nets on the bottom of the lake, and it's kind of like a roach motel. The fish will swim in through a series of tunnels and gates and doors, and once they get in, they can't get out. But what's good about this is that these nets are placed uh, very deep, and uh, that's not where the, the Yellowstone cutthroat are. So uh, when they pull the nets up, it's primarily or almost exclusively lake trout, so we're not seeing any bycatch of, of, of the cutthroat. Uh, one of the nets near a place called Callaway Island, which is a spawning location, they place, they've just uh, captured over 500 in, in one setting. So it's, it's, it's something that offers a lot of promise. Clear Creek is probably the largest spawning tributary to Yellowstone Lake. And it historically has had a weir where they would monitor and count fish, but over time, the age and environmental conditions had it caused that to cease to function, but that has now uh, uh, been replaced, so they're going to be able, starting next year, to start monitoring uh, the fish that are, that are moving up the creek to, to spawn uh, in, in the spring. So they'll get a much better number <coughs> excuse me, um, of the fish that are, uh, fish that are surviving and what, what the population trend is. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing uh, during the Western Regional Meeting is to coordinate the efforts of the three TU states uh, when we get together at that meeting. Uh, the first priority and in the initial work with this uh, Yellowstone Conservation Project is suppression of the lake trout, but there are many other issues that, will, that need uh, attention and need to be addressed. Uh, there's hybridization of, of uh, cutthroat in places like Slough Creek, uh, the uh, native grayling is, is limited to some, some fairly uh, short reaches of stream, but the, the, this project, this effort, will move uh, forward uh, after several years of, of working with the lake trout suppression uh, to work in these other areas. Well, that, That is uh, uh, one of the two commercial boats that they're using the netting. And the key, and this is really something that uh, we learned on Lake Pend in Idaho, uh, it takes somebody that knows what they're doing uh, in, a, in a deep, cold lake setting to, to net sufficient numbers of fish. So the guys that are running the commercial boats are from the Great Lakes regions. They've been working on Lake Pend They've been working on Swan Lake in Montana. And they're also now working on Yellowstone Lake and getting them involved and giving them the information about the uh, life history behavior of these fish is really uh, paying dividends at this point. <clears throat> Continuing on the conservation agenda side and the work of the NLC. Uh, you've already heard some about the, the TU DARE project in the Driftless area. Uh, this past year they had approximately four million dollars in funding. We were able to uh, restore uh, 10 plus miles of stream. Uh, included in this effort and in this money were uh, three Embraces Stream grants and they're anticipating uh, being able to obtain approximately $4 million uh, more for work next year. And there is a uh, newsletter now going out on a regular basis. This is one of the uh, real success stories uh, in, in grassroots advocacy in, this, in the organization. And a lot of other programs are being modeled on what has been able to be accomplished by the, the TU DARE folks. Uh, responsible energy development. Uh, this was a work group that uh, had life breathed back into it this year. 
uh, there was a realization that we had staff in the east and staff in the west and volunteers in both places uh, working on very many of this, the same types of issues, the same types of challenges and problems. And, and so uh, the, the work group is, is serving a role to help uh, coordinate the efforts that are ongoing going between the East and the West. There are now conference calls going on where they're discussing uh, back and forth and also helping to uh, coordinate staff and volunteer efforts. Based on uh, preliminary discussions among the NLC, this is going to be uh, another focus area a focus area and an expanded area uh, during the upcoming year. This is just a, a short editorial comment on communication. I should learn from this, but I, I don't. As far as the organizational capacity side of the NLC, uh, last year in Bend at the NLC business meeting, we authorized a new work group, the Women's, the women's Initiative. And uh, we appointed Mary Weiss as chairperson for that work group. And right away they went to work. She selected a, a uh, very vibrant and energetic group of volunteers. There's a number of of uh, TU staffers that are essentially donating their time. There are no formal assignments, but they've been working on this issue. They, re they recognize the need, and they've come up with a mission statement for this work group, and uh, with a goal to increase the number of female TU members, looking at the demographic of how many females are fishing and how many are members. Um, uh, we're not doing anywhere near as well as we should having female members in this organization. Uh, they're looking at developing programs to address the needs of female members to attract more, to serve their, their interest group better, and working towards getting more females in TU leadership positions. I'm pleased to report in my state at our council level, uh, we, uh, uh, in, in over the winter uh, had our first female executive committee uh, member elected to our council and the second uh, should be elected at our meeting uh, in two weeks. So uh, we hope to provide uh, an example in Montana as to you know what the face of TU should look like. And again, kudos to Mary Weiss uh, for, for what she's done. She's provided outstanding leadership. This spring, this work group uh, presented the Board of Trustees with a list of 28 uh, uh, items of proposed programs, projects, and recommendation uh, for TU, to what TU should be doing in this area. Um, it was a little overwhelming to see that. It was a fantastic body of work. And, and uh, what the work group is doing now is uh, refining that list. And there will be a, probably a top five priority list. Uh, some of these require uh, staff assistance. Some of these require uh, budgets to, to implement. But some of them uh, can be done directly. So uh, during this next year, uh, the ones that can be done directly, the ones we can begin working on, uh, will be implemented and the work group will be working with staff to develop budgets to implement additional programs. So this work group is, is, is really on a roll. And as you heard, we're looking at uh, in the next three years of an expectation of having 250,000 members in TU. And I believe that what this work group is doing dovetails uh, very, very closely with, with that effort. I want to mention that the goal of this work group is not to create uh, a separate TU or a TU within TU, uh, but to address a gap, to address a need that we have in the way that we do things so that uh, women members feel uh, more interested and more welcome to, to join us. And then I think uh, the rest will take care of itself and, and, and uh, we will be operating as one TU. 
Another of our work groups is the fundraising work group uh, led by uh, Jim Walker of Arizona. And uh, they have published over 70 fundraising ideas in the tackle box for chapters and councils to look at, to use as a tool. And they have uh, also conducted webinar trainings. Uh, they are sharing this information uh, at regional meetings. And they, they really kicked it off last year uh, at, the, at the annual meeting. They also have prepared material to assist chapters and councils uh, with their fundraising efforts. And those are housed in a couple of locations on the website. It's a lesson I think that uh, we all need to pay attention to is that uh, it's very difficult to uh, accomplish a lot of conservation work uh, without money. And while we are expanding our, our national development staff, uh, Jim and his group have really helped to expand uh, the possibilities and the tools that are available to chapters and council to, to raise money to, to do the grassroots level work. Education uh, work group, also known as the Youth Initiative, uh, have, have established uh, a core value statement for our youth education programs. And our next generation, sharing the values of Trout and Unlimited with the conservations, uh, conservationists of tomorrow. Our native and wild trout, educating youth in the science of fish and their ecosystems. Our cold water resources, protecting, restoring, and being stewards of lakes, rivers, and streams. Our angling heritage, engaging in the activity, ethics, and community of fishing. And our responsibility, maintaining safe, accessible, and enjoyable opportunities for young people. This is really a great a blueprint to have in mind when we approach our youth education programs. And the, the, you know, the youth will be the the, the next leaders of this organization, they'll be the ones that will, will carry on the mantle. So this is uh, very important, and I think that this is a, a great step forward in starting to crystallize uh, what our youth education program is all about. One of the first byproducts of this is uh, this group has produced a casting video, and this is a video that's to train the TU volunteers on how to, to teach and educate people on, on casting. It was put together uh, with the assistance of Bruce Richards, uh, formerly of uh, 3M, and Molly Semenik, an FFF uh, certified fly caster from Livingston. And this is currently uh, available on TU's Vimeo, chap or, excuse me, Vimeo channel. And uh, the work group is looking for ways to uh, get this uh, more widely distributed, but we're looking at raising the level of how we, uh, of how we train uh, the people that we're te are teaching the youth that are in our programs. Regional meetings. This was one of our internal priorities. Uh, the momentum that has been growing the past several years uh, increased again this past year. Uh, the regions in TU used to be defined under the old uh, NRB uh, form of organization, and then they were lost when we uh, uh, came to the present form of organization. And so the regions that have developed have developed uh, more or less uh, spontaneously. Obviously, there's a geographical factor. There's a community of interest factor. But it's just been a kind of hit and miss over time. But the regions that we now have are the Northeast, uh, the Mid-Atlantic, the Southeast, the Upper Midwest, and this is the, the TU Dare, the Driftless Area. And they have been having fairly specific uh, uh, recovery and fundraising uh, type trainings at their workshops, but they are now starting next year going to expand that to a more typical uh, format and agenda coverage of a regional meeting. Uh, the Mid-South and then the Western. And what we're seeing is a significant increase in the number of TU members and staff attending these meetings. The uh, agenda items and, and the programs are, are, uh, in, are definitely increasing in quality. 
<clears throat> these regional meetings are providing an opportunity to coordinate the conservation efforts uh, on a regional basis. This was this had been missing. Uh, chapters in, in two states might be working on identical issues, but they weren't talking to each other, but that is that's now changing. Uh, they're uh, combining resources. Uh, they're, they're meeting face to face and they're communicating their experiences and exchanging their ideas. So this is very effective and as I noted, uh, one of the outgrowths of the western region is that we're now coordinating the, the TU effort in Yellowstone Park through the, the western regional meeting. Uh, continuing efforts uh, to move this to, a, to a, a broader service to the organization is to try and get uh, more chapter participation uh, and get chapter leaders uh, and chapter members, more of them to attend these. Uh, and so there's an effort to move these meetings around within the region so the travel can be closer, uh, more convenient, uh, uh, at least once every three or four years for, for most of the chapters. We are getting great support from Vol Ops in organizing these uh, regional meetings and the uh, other staff uh, is, is providing presentations and, and coming uh, to the uh, meetings to, to meet the grassroots leaders. So there's a lot more uh, familiarity now between uh, our national staff and our grassroots at all level, and that's paying a lot of dividends. If they, if they have questions, uh, if they have ideas, they now can associate a name to a face and have a familiar, familiarity, and there's more likelihood that they will pick up the phone and call or send an email. And at, this, uh, uh, at these regional meetings, um, you know, you see all levels. And this, this, this slide is, oops, I went too far, didn't I? This slide is indicative of that. Uh, this was a Western regional meeting in Missoula a couple years ago. And, and you'll, you see a, a chapter member seated in the raft. And, and, uh, uh, and on the left, you see a... Uh, a council chair from Colorado, and next to him is a, is a staff person from Montana, and there are two grassroots trustees in the middle. So that's very indicative of the, of the uh, one TU, uh, everybody working together for common goals uh, in action. That's true. I don't have that picture this time, though, Mick. So what's next for the grassroots? We will be discussing the conservation agenda tomorrow in the NSL, NL, NL, excuse me, NLC business meeting. Uh, our initial discussions, uh, what we're seeing is that I expect there'll be an emphasis continuing on issues surrounding the mineral and oil and gas extraction. It's going to be expanded to include the distribution uh, of, of oil and gas. A lot of the pipelines that are being proposed are, are very damaging and we need uh, more expertise and, and, and improved strategy in that regard. Uh, dam removal, you've seen the successes of the, uh, the, the work on the Penobscots in the presentations this morning. Uh, on the west coast, the Elwha dams came out this year and within a couple of days uh, the first wild steelhead were, were moving up above the dam site looking for new places to spawn. Uh, and all this habitat that gets reconnected with the dam removal is, is extremely valuable to our efforts. And so we have dams in, in California, we have dams on the Snake River. So there's going to be more uh, emphasis on that topic. And continuing with our native fish uh, restoration and conservation. On the organizational side, uh, we're seeing uh, a strong interest develop in the NLC with uh, finding a role to help uh, with the evolution of Trout Unlimited uh, become more of a web-based community. And this is through our new strategic plan. This is through the websites that are, that are uh, coming online soon. And the NLC wants to be able to be there to help make that transition as smooth and effective uh, as possible. Uh, want to continue uh, working to increase memberships. 
Uh, the Women's Initiative, for example, will be helpful with that. One of the other things that we're looking at is retention of members. These are people that we've already uh, had in the organization and we need to track them at the time that their membership is expiring and make sure that it's just not an oversight that, that uh, uh, most of these people we should be able to get back into the organization. And if we do that, uh, we're going to see a dramatic increase uh, in, in uh, our membership numbers and I think this is an example of some low-hanging fruit. Uh, education programs, we want to see a continuum from the fourth, fifth, sixth graders that trot in the classroom up through university students. And as I said, the goal last year was to, to reinvigorate our work groups. Uh, that process will definitely continue. The last slide. Uh, my observation is that, and my report is that the grassroots is doing very well. We have very st strong reasons to be optimistic about the uh, direction uh, and the uh, vitality of our organization. We are doing a lot of things very well. We do have those areas for improvement, but we are definitely looking in turn internally looking at those issues and uh, making steps to, to provide further improvement. And as always, we will be facing uh, the new challenges that seem to arise every year. A little cautionary note uh, from my perspective, uh, the grassroots uh, volunteers are served, and this is again the 377 chapters and 36 councils, are being ably served by a volunteer operations staff of four people. And I think uh, what I would say is we all need to uh, pay attention, keep our eye on the ball, that as we are growing our organization, as we're increasing our uh, development staff, as we're increasing our abilities to communicate uh, through the website, uh, have new communities, as we are increasing our membership, we need to make sure uh, that concurrently we are also providing increasing proportional resources to vol ops so that we have the staff and the budget for them to do their work to 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 manage and support uh, uh, the grassroots as we deal with ever more complex issues. Uh, this has been uh, impossible to try and decide what to put into this as a review of the year. Um, you know, I know I haven't come close to capturing and describing just the energy, the accomplishments, the passion, and the dedication of our grassroots. To close, I will just simply say they are superb. Thank you.